At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. The Sacramento region is quickly becoming known as the farm to fork capital of the world. Eating fresh and healthy is on the cover of magazines and is a regular focus of television and newspaper media. However, what of those who are being left behind and enjoying the fruits of the farm to fork movement? Joining us today is Rabbi David Wexler Azen. He is the founder and spiritual force behind a new effort in bringing farm to every fork and creating a young army of activists with the help of local chefs and the food industry in bringing delicious, healthy meals to every table in this region and beyond. Also with us is Beth Southhorn, the executive director of Life Steps, a statewide provider of social services in affordable housing communities. So what is this farm to every four concept? Sure. You know, a lot of people wonder what keeps them up at night, what keeps you up at night, and what keeps me up at night is kids going to bed hungry. And so I have tried to crack the code for how can we make sure that every family can feed their children and themselves. And so Farm to Every Fork is this insistence that food justice be the centerpiece on our tables and that we figure out how to bring food to people rather than try to bring people to food and how we can then create prepared meals that make it easier for people to eat. What is the definition of food justice? The definition of food justice is that there is walkable nutrition for everybody, that, no, that we don't have any more food deserts. There, you know, those are defined as where somebody doesn't ha has to go more than a mile for fresh produce. We have five times as many fast food places in Sacramento County. We have a third of the kids who are not healthy and it's a result of a lot of the lower income neighborhoods where actually the stores have left those neighborhoods, right? And the corner stores with little displays of produce, it's not great produce, it's overpriced, it's a dollar for a banana, and we know that it just don't cost that much. So it's being able to make sure that a single mom who comes home from work doesn't have to take a three buses 90 minutes both ways to get the mac and cheese that she's gonna end up buying because it's the easiest thing to transport. And, and what is the relationship between this effort and affordable housing and the type of communities that your organization serves? Yes, so Life Steps is a social service provider of over 26,000 homes throughout the state of California. Um, and we've been uh, around since 1996 and what we've learned is oftentimes when people think of poverty, they don't realize that the cards, uh, the deck is really stacked against uh, impoverished communities. And some of that is just your local parks, being safe and decent, but more importantly, the food um, entities really aren't uh, substantial within those communities. And oftentimes moms, you know, because they don't have uh, the produce there on site, you know, and the kids are hungry, they'll send them to the quick mark store and there's plenty of those that are, you know, able to take- Filled with chips and sodas and, and things like that. And so, you know, just the other day, you know, we had a worker that was a social worker uh, at the community that was watching two kids go to school at 1030 in the, in the uh, morning and they were caught, called on it, like, why are you late to school? And they said, well, we didn't, you know, we slept in, you know, too late and we didn't, you know, eat last night. So the, the basic things, these, these kids are going to school without food, you know, and so when we work with uh, Robert David when he approached me and he's talked about a sustainable food program that had a vocational entity where you could actually teach the community how to cook a squash and how to um, be able to go into the community and learn how to use some of the things they're getting from the local food banks. That's where the connection's missing. So when he approached me and said, I've got this great idea. We've got the, you know, the uh, cooks, you know, in Sacramento County, the, you know, Selins and Mulvaney's, you know, these are the key, you know, players that really are interested in taking and giving some of their, their knowledge about uh, healthy cooking. Excellent point. Let's talk about that for a second. You, you raised a very interesting piece of this, which is that we talk about farm to fork and eating fresher and healthier, but you're doing something different in that you're taking some of our world-class chefs that we have here in Sacramento 
and somehow getting them to transfer some knowledge down to children. Tell us about that. Sure. So the kind of the concept is that you want people to have ownership of their own food system and restaurateurs know about owning their own food system called a restaurant. And so ha enabling them to get out into the lower income communities and train a kind of a cadre of community chefs is really at the core of what we're looking at doing. Community chefs. Community chefs, okay. exactly. And in fact, actually, because Mulvaney and Selland aren't available all the time because they have their own businesses to run, what we're really looking at doing is empowering the community to choose their own top community chef to help train them on a regular basis and help them organize their own food system. So we're actually launching a competition for the first top community chef. Really? In Sacramento, yes. So it's kind of like, you know, Food Network Top Chef or exactly. Iron Chef. That's right, right. Top or Chef Community Edition, right? Or Extreme Makeover. It's kind of Extreme Makeover and Top Chef combined into What's one. What's been the reception so far? Everybody's really excited. They're really looking forward to uh, what's coming. It's the next phase for Farm to Fork in Sacramento and, and we think beyond. Uh, the, the, we have uh, that business and housing uh, uh, secretary and her deputy secretary for housing policies on our board. And they're really looking at this as something that can really go a lot further than just Sacramento. Well, what I love about it, Beth, is that it starts to speak to a, a answer to a question that came up recently in an event I was at. And that was, uh, I was at an event talking about sustainable communities and there was this big push you know, low-income people have to eat better and, you know, eat healthier and eat, eat more natural. Mm -hmm. And a, a woman who was, who was in the audience, who was a pharmacist, said, in low-income communities, uh, mothers have to fill stomachs. That's right. And we have to, the, all we have access to are sometimes the lowest cost things that create the bulkiest right. food. Right, mm -hmm. ramen. And even if we have access to food, we have to have the means, the places to cook it, yep. and we have to know how to prepare it. And so bringing in farm to fork fresh doesn't necessarily mean that that, that ever gets consumed. Right, well, and that's the, the concept for us. We have food banks throughout the state of California that are really wonderful and great resources, and a lot of good farmers you know, donate to the food banks. They give the, uh, the produce to the food banks, the food banks, we get it to the communities. What's missing for us is the link between when you get that type of food, how do you cook with it? Because if it's not part of their culture and they've never seen it before, you know, I don't, you know, we're usually we go onto Food Network and we figure it out on 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 our phones or on our computers. But when impoverished communities, they don't have resources like flip phones where you're, you know, you're doing your Android or your your I, uh, uh, iPhones or you know, oftentimes not even computers. So the link between connection of how to use something for technology to what we use on an everyday basis isn't being made and the education really isn't being given directly to the community members so they'll get a pumpkin and they'll say thank you so much that's wonderful they're always gener uh, generous with their with their gratitude because they are hungry but they don't necessarily know what to do with that afterwards so they they oftentimes we, we it goes to waste so the link really is like how do we stop that and how do we combine with really great partners within our Sacramento community and that starts with SHRA, who actually owns the community that pr pays for our ser services. The community is where and what? Yeah, so Phoenix Park is the kickoff community here in uh, South Sac, and it's owned by uh, Sacramento Redevelopment Agency, um, Housing and Redevelopment Agency, and that, that um, they That's pay- That's on Franklin Boulevard, That's right? Uh, on sh just off of Shining Star, and right? Yes. Right. So, mm -hmm. in that community, um, they've done a lot of great things. We have social workers there that go in. We have educational components. We have many, many great partners with the Unified School District that do after school. But there's not a, a health food connection link. So that's what we're trying to attack here with our partnership. And we're really, really happy that Rabbi David approached us. So, Rabbi David, uh, there is a, a certain amount of, of skepticism, I would assume about this whole movement on bringing uh, fresher foods mm -hmm. at, to the table and that kids will consume them. Yes. Over the past few years, the, the papers have been full of stories about how uh, First Lady Michelle Obama has tried, you know, as part of her initiative to get uh, healthier food into school lunches right. and that kids are dumping food wholesale. So what's different about Fresher Sacramento, your movement, than that effort on the part of the federal government. 
Well, the first thing I want to say is that that's not completely true. There are lots of kids who have actually started to eat better, and that's the stories that you don't hear. Oh. So the ones who'd like to deep six this movement would like you to think that that's all that's happening. But uh, Sac City Unified, for example, has done a great job of putting a salad bar in every elementary school. And Kola you know, all power to them. Uh, Brenda and Diana and that whole team has done a great job. And there are kids eating much, much better and taking fresh fruits and vegetables because there's also an educational program that goes with it. And uh, Amber Stott at Food Literacy uh, Center is doing a great job with that. When people get the fresh taste in them and when they're growing it in a garden and then they're tasting it, kids' eyes light up and they do like it. So just well, want to put that to bed. Uh, uh, However, help me understand what works. What gets them to sort of get over the chasm from Lay's right. potato chips over. So when you're personally involved in something, right, and you and you get a chance to get your hands on it, whether it's with the gardening or the cooking preparation, it, you're invested in it, right? And so that's that whole sense of ownership. So by having kids who want to be community chefs be the ones who are helping prepare, not everybody has to learn. It's inefficient to try to have every household shop properly, cook properly, budget properly. We believe that if we have what's what we call a community meal plan, like a college meal plan, then you can have people making that food readily available for people to pick up and take home. And then the community is engaged with that. And the kids who are, are doing that are gaining new skills, they're gaining workforce skills, job training, they're getting stipends, they're getting pride, self-efficacy, all of those different things. So how it's kind does, of all wrapped up into how one. How does this community meal plan work? Yeah, so we're looking at uh, to start with just three days a week, uh, where we once we identify the top chef of the community, we'll actually work with interns from the different culinary uh, academy as well as uh, some of the um, restaurants that we just listed, and we'll actually um, give them the opportunity to learn how to you know prepare food and how to cook, um, and we'll also partner with um, your gentleman, uh, uh, the barbecue guy that's got yeah, the... Yeah, Mark know. Carey from Sac City Eats. We have a mobile barbecue unit that we can actually bring in and park in the community. Really? As a permanent fixture, actually. The health department has let us know that that's possible. That's the, the game changer right there. Yeah. Because if we can have that and a refrigerated truck, the refrigerated truck can go to the farms, emerging farms, minority farmers, help them out, pick up stuff, buy even the stuff that they can't sell at a farmer's market because we'll chop it and prepare it and puree it and put it into things that they can't sell when it's a little bit damaged at the farmer's market. They'll bring that, get the meats, prepare it on the barbecue, put it back into the refrigerated truck so when people come home, here's your ready to heat, ready to eat meal. Now, do people eat together like community meal or is it back, do I come out of my, it's, my home? Get, it's a little bit of both, both, but usually they'll pick it up and um, they'll pay for their food for, the, you know, instead of a mom who's working and has three kids and trying to pull it together and then I got to do dinner, that's already prepared. It's a, a resource that they, they pick up and it's economical and it's good food. You know, we actually have on our board uh, Jim Durst, who is actually um, the owner of Durst Organic Farms. So we're literally pouring organic farming into this movement. So um, the individuals that we're serving Usually in impoverished communities, they can't pay for organic foods, but there's resources and collaborations that we can do that we know that work that actually can give the individuals in those same communities the same luxuries that you and I probably have. So and I have to ask you there's both. There's also a community garden, and we're looking at other opportunities to develop gardening in the yeah. community so yeah. they can sell actually uh, their gardening learned. right to the food movement in the community. So I have to ask you both. Yeah. What is the best thing that one of these community chefs has whipped up that you have tasted? <laughs> Well, Oliver Ridgway uh, helped a, a team early on. They did something with spaghetti squash and beets that was just extraordinary. Uh, and so it was, it was delicious. But then uh, Patrick did something with, uh, with sweet potato latkes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then Randall did something with, with eggplants. Uh, it is just eggplants. amazing just what incredible. they do. Yeah, but the great thing is anybody that's interested in Phoenix Park, that's interested in this uh, experience and being, they can be part of this movement. You know, they can actually be participatory in the uh, kitchen. There's resource there that as the money comes in from paying from the food, that they actually have a sustainable way of being able to earn uh, some job skills as well as income. And we're partnered with the right people so that when we have a superstar, they can elevate up into some of these other really uh, wonderful meals. Now your organization works across the state. Yeah. And so you're involved in this experiment here in Sacramento at Phoenix Park. 
What do you see on the ground in terms of change by uh, this, the presence of, of this activity in terms of the community itself? Yeah, um, excitement for food, right? They're not, it's not just let me get a chip and you know, satisfy something because it's really salty. You know, they're educating and they're learning about, well, what is you know, this pumpkin? How do we cook it? And then they start competing with each other on how they're cooking it and, uh, and, and finding other recipes and, and going to the library and making the effort. But the kids are also kind of excited. So it's the parents, because it's not just about the kids. We have, to, we have to attack this on all levels. Like We have to engage the parents. We need to engage the seniors. We need to engage the kids so that the model for health is finally dis established right there in the community. And so those leaders that we're looking for and the ones that we're engaging that are excited about this, they're the hope for the larger community. You're, they're the ones taking the stand and saying, yeah, we're gonna be about health. And by, by having this kind of momentum built and the excitement and the fun, pr fun component of this, it allows people to kind of say, oh, well, I wasn't really thinking ever of eating a squash, but you know, everybody's making it so excited, let me jump in. And that's exactly what we want. That's how we change lives. And that's how we change poverty. There's another piece of the program that I uh, want to bring to the table, which is that this is a sales program. It's not a giveaway program. It's not sustainable as a giveaway program. Uh, we try really hard to feed people by giving things away, but there are resources out there. We, are, we have CalFresh, uh, the SNAP dollars, the foods, people know them as food stamps. We're qualifying to be able to receive those for this model, and when we do that, what we're going to then end up doing is taking a percentage of the sales and putting them into a venture capital fund so that the community can actually launch new products for itself and market and then make a profit from that and create their own food business as it were so the kids can apply in fact at our launch we took what would have been the percentage we're, we're at the launch we're, we, we gave away the food uh, that night to get people excited about this opportunity, the barbecue and the whole thing and the smells and, and, uh, and a, a little bit of a cooking competition and fitness rangers and obstacle course. So we're doing the fitness and the food, but there's also an economic empowerment piece to this. And that is that you take some of those sales and you reinvest in your, in your own local food business. And then people in the community who come up with great recipes that other people like, or the kids launch a value added food product that they can then sell in the farmer's markets nearby. And then they can really build up some economic power and some assets from venture, this. A venture capital fund. A venture capital fund, fund for so every the community. So the question that, that uh, all of us want to know the answer to is, yes. how did a nice rabbi like you <laughs> get into a business like this? Yeah, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, right? <laughs> So my senior sermon in rabbinical school, uh, believe it or not, I'm, I'm much more ancient than I uh, seem to appear, uh, was a week after Ronald Reagan was reelected in 1984. Really? And I grew up in a Republican household, uh, but I wanted to figure out what was a bipartisan way of uh, speaking to both sides of the aisle. And my, my thesis was, if you advocate for free markets, you have a social responsibility to make sure everyone has access to them. Right. And that's been burning in me ever since. And eight years ago, I kind of stumbled into this food thing and this idea that if kids were actually making money from good eating, they might be more likely to do so. So we created this whole movement of sales reps for fresh produce, healthy fundraising, and that was fresh producers, which has now morphed into this fresher idea, fresher Sacramento, fresher California, fresher USA. And uh, so that's been burning in me. And, and so for the last eight years, I've been chipping away at what is this model that, that could work. And, uh, and so I'm really excited to have reached this point where I also was a film school. Uh, I got a, a fellowship to Temple University Film School. So I'm bringing that into the, the whole TV yeah, piece. There, there's a, the, you have an idea for the change some sort game. of te yeah, television show. So, right. So the change game is that competition for the top community chefs, right? And they'll be working with teams of youth and will select through that process that that top community chef and the teams oh, will be competing. I get it. So now this week. this it's competition exactly. is the precursor to the television show. Exactly. That's right. okay. Exactly. The program requires it regardless, right? Mm -hmm. So the TV show is kind of like dressing uh, on top of it and a marketing component for the program itself. But the real basis of it is that idea that competition, people get excited about that, right? So we've had 
uh, uh, the first summer we did this, the first Farm to Fork Festival, we had some kids from the Roberts Family Development Center versus a team from the Boys and Girls Club, and they were really going at it. And I will tell you that the girls from, from North Sac, they lost by a hair. They were still upset months <laughs> later. They were mad. They were really mad. They won by one point at a Dr. Pan Health Fair earlier on in the summer, but yeah. the finale, they kind of just came short. But they were in Oliver Ridgeway's kitchen at the Grange week after week after week, tasting new things, learning new things, really dedicated. That's what competition does for people. And, and so if this is successful here, yeah. for the, the communities you serve and that you're involved with throughout the state, what do you see are the implications is what might the world be like if this is a replicatable model five years out? Well, my, yeah, good question. <laughs> so um, my stand is that we're going to spread this out, and whether it be a Life Steps community that we provide services or another community that another good and valuable service provider is providing, I'm just excited about it. So as an example, we have a tremendous move uh, in the California uh, government right now for green building. Affordable housing does a lot of green buildings. We actually have a developer in L.A. who actually has contacted us and said, we have 40 plots of you know good land uh, on the roof to be able to actually garden, and we want our our kids and our families to learn how to garden. So this is the kind of program that we'll take and duplicate elsewhere. Um, and he'll have other opportunities, you know, Fresher will have uh, other opportunities to expand in other communities as well um, outside of Life Stuff, so I don't want it to make it ju just that he's ours. Um, but it is a wonderful gift to be, be able to be part of something that's cutting edge and more importantly, serves the individuals in a real way that excites them in, in a way that's gonna help their health and give them the same opportunities that oftentimes um, some of the other communities of wealth have. Um, and when you're poor, you just don't have some of those resources. So we're bringing it in, taking a stand, and spreading it. Not only do you not have the resources, but you certainly don't have access to world-class chefs. Right. Tell us a story about how you got these chefs who are nationally and internationally rated mm -hmm. to participate in a program cooking for low-income communities, because that is not their audience. Right. Well, it is actually, uh, in some ways, Patrick Mulvaney for years has worked with the Oak Ridge Elementary School and, and ha worked with the fourth to sixth graders there. So it's not out of their, uh, their, uh, their realm. And actually, most of them really want to do this. In fact, I would say all of them want to. The California Restaurant, really? Asso yeah. California Restaurant Association endorsed this. The Sacramento chapter, I went to the board meeting. Chris Yarosh from uh, Broderick's and uh, Capital Dime invited me as chair. And they're excited. They want to get this out of being a shishi movement for yeah. people who can afford the top restaurants. They want p everybody to be able to share in the largesse of our region and in eating well. So it's actually it wasn't hard to to convince them. But it, you know, for seven years I've been plowing the fields in this whole movement and innovating and uh, trying to do different things. And so the the idea was pretty compelling to them. Actually, it was very compelling. And, it wasn't hard. And, you, at, at and that you're point. training this, this army of young people. Yes. How, how many people have gone through the program so far? We've trained about 500 kids as nutrition educators, and now we're really moving into this whole other uh, area. So we, we think there's hundreds and thousands that ultimately will come out of this. And when they come out and they're now nutrition educators, what are you hoping that they will do in the future, in addition to maybe being? Right far more open and receptive to eating better and living a healthier lifestyle. What do you hope that they do beyond that? You know, when I first established the nonprofit, I called it Fresh Producers because mm -hmm. my goal was that every child should be able to graduate high school with the skills of a producer. And the word produce actually means to bring into being. So a producer is somebody who knows how to make things happen. You know that, right? So we want every kid to have that entrepreneurial ability and to have worked as a team to make good things happen. So that's really the goal. And for them to also have some equity. Uh, it turns out that if a child has three or $400 to their name, they're much more likely to go to college. Well, we think they can have thousands of dollars actually saved up from birth and beyond just by eating well and then participating in the program. Beth, do you, do you think that participation in, in activities like this make an impact beyond just health lifestyle? For instance, uh, would it have any impact on things like being more attuned to education and educational achievement? Yeah, because it makes education fun. It's taking the schools and what they do and their hard labor all day long, but it's actually built, bringing it actually into the community so they're getting that same amount of growth, only it's fun. And so I remember some of my best classes were science, 
because we actually did things that were like, you know, connect dots and you learned, right? So when you kind of do that, you know, for all of the kids, as well as the parents, because as the kids learn, they come home and they start talking about health, all of a sudden you're putting down the chip. I mean, I have a niece who's 15 that I live with and stuff who I'm, you know, give me the next pizza. And she's like, that's not really, Aunt, uh, Aunt Beth, that's not very healthy. So <laughs> so it's it's really creating a, a model throughout throughout the family, throughout the community. And the larger answer is, you know, when you're not having to go down to, you know, stop work and go down to the doctor and bring your kid because they've got diabetes in an early age, these are the things that healthcare, it impacts their finances. So having that health component as part of it so that they're not going to the hospitals, they're not going to the doctors, and they get those checkups are really, really key. And we're going to leave it there. Okay. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KBIE. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.